The fall is one of the most magical times of the year. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. You know, as a gardener, I've always been captivated by the beauty of this season. I think it's because you can actually see Mother Nature transforming herself before your very eyes. And it's also a time of year that I can begin to do a little prep work for the seasons ahead. Today, we're going to enjoy all the color and glory fall has to offer. From the brilliant orange and reds of the maples to the clear yellows of ginkgo trees, and not to mention the warm sunburst colors of the various oaks. Boy, have we got a treat for you. We'll travel the country, starting right here on the Cumberland Plateau in Middle Tennessee. Then it's off to the New England countryside for a tour of autumn colors. I'll give you some advice on picking the best plants for color in your garden, all to help you capture the beauty of the season. We'll also take a look at several projects that will save you time and money throughout the year, plus discover the rewards of planting now and planning for your garden's future. Just sit back and enjoy what makes autumn so special. Doesn't it look like someone's been around here with a paintbrush? Just look at the intense colors in this red maple. You have to wonder, how does a leaf that's been green all through the spring and summer suddenly turn these intense shades of red? Well, before we get to that, I think it's nice to know that North America is one of the best places to have beautiful autumn displays. Because of the unique climate and rich diversity of trees, we have this tapestry of fall color. So how does this change occur? Well, let's start first with the color yellow. You see, leaves are green because of chlorophyll, and it's constantly being produced and breaking down all at the same time, until in the fall when chlorophyll production slacks off. That's when the yellow pigments in the leaf are revealed. A good example of this is the ginkgo tree. Now, some of the best known trees for their rich oranges and reds are the oaks, gums, and various maples. What you're seeing here are the complex sugars and other chemicals that have built up or have been trapped in the leaves. What we've been talking about are complex chemical reactions that go on in here, but it's about a lot more than that. You see, it's also about the weather. For the best fall display, plants need plenty of moisture during the summer. Then in the fall, they need cool nights under 45 degrees, followed by days that are clear and bright. Then they can really show off. For more information about trees and shrubs that produce magnificent fall displays, just log on to my website. That's pallensmith.com. The fall is such a beautiful time of year, particularly in certain parts of the country, like New England, where trees have always painted a picture postcard landscape. These are such magnificent creatures. And after shading and protecting us from the summer sun, they now bid their leaves a glorious farewell, only for them to rest until the cycle begins again next year. As the trees slip off into their winter sleep, I had an opportunity to visit with a man very well acquainted with these noble giants of the plant world. David Smith is the former director of horticulture at White Flower Farm in Litchfield, Connecticut. He's English by birth, but he's spent a long time on this side of the Atlantic. Things would be rather dull if we had greens the whole year round. Yes, it would be. And um, the colors really tend to uh, start in August, and you get the less and less chlorophyll being produced. And I think the other colors that are there without us seeing them tend to accentuate. And okay, they and come, come forward. To, forward to the surface and uh, then we see these brilliant colors coming along, some reds and oranges. New England is the perfect showcase for fall color and it seems like new varieties of trees are being developed every day. Here in Middle Tennessee, this area is called the nursery capital of the world 
And Jerry Blankenship explains why it's so well suited for tree cultivation. This area has advantages to it, to growing, uh, to growing trees and shrubs. Tennessee's kind of in a transition zone. Uh, we can grow plants that'll do well to the south, and we can grow plants that'll do well in the north. Uh, our clay soil makes it uh, really easy to put a good high quality root ball on the plant and, and enables us to ship that plant you know, either north or south. We're seeing more emphasis on you know, developers and whatnot around here that are, are plant developers, uh, developing plants that are you know, for four season interest, uh, you know, looking for good bark characteristics, fruit, flower, foliage, uh, you know, everything that makes a plant interesting to a consumer. You know, we're seeing that more in, more in our industry versus you know, years ago, you know, plants were developed for bloom or, or maybe a particular foliage color. Now we're trying to find plants that are applicable to all seasons. Now fall is about a lot more than trees. So in a few minutes, I'll show you what you need to be doing in your garden right now to be prepared for the upcoming seasons and to save you time and money in the months ahead. And if falling leaves have you working hard, why not put them to work for you? I'll show you how, coming up. I don't know about you, but this summer it was difficult for me to get excited about working in my garden because of the heat. But now that cooler temperatures have arrived, I look for every opportunity I can to be outdoors to enjoy the splendor of the season. And what better time for me to take care of some of that much needed prep work in the garden? For example, just a few weeks ago, my morning glory vine was in full bloom. But now that it's spent, it's time to clear it away for next year. Now as I pull the vines down, I'm allowing seeds to fall to the ground. I do this for many of my plants. You see, these are called hardy volunteers because at the end of their season, they drop seeds which can return the next year, like larkspur, soloisia, and globe amaranth. Now there are some things you don't want to come back in your garden, like diseases and pests. If you find problem areas like this, remove them. This even goes for the leaves of your roses that are afflicted with black spot. As you remove disease materials, don't throw them in your compost bin. This will help keep you from spreading the problem around your garden next year. Now, if you're using pruners on infected materials, you might want to clean them by dipping them in a household disinfectant. When I cut back many of my perennials, such as peonies and lilies, I mark them so I'll know where they are in the early spring. By adding a generous layer of mulch to certain parts of my garden, I can keep winter weeds down and sometimes even defy the critics by bringing something through that normally doesn't winter over like this begonia. The leaves of perennials, like these hostas, will be the perfect addition to some really rich compost for next year's garden. There's really nothing better for your garden than compost, and there's no better ingredient for making compost than leaves. They're a natural, and this time of year they're plentiful, as well as being nutrient rich. The reason that leaves make such good compost is they're made from lots of complex chemicals that, once broken down, plants love. I figured out a long time ago that I don't always have to rake all of the leaves I use in my compost. My neighbors will do it for me. They're only happy for me to haul away all of the leaves they've raked and bagged. They just don't know what they're giving up. This is what it's all about, fresh compost, right out of the oven or compost bin. I like to pack leaves in these bins made of heavy timbers, but you can also make compost in a wire cage. The recipe is simple. It just takes organic matter like leaves, and you can use grass clippings or even kitchen scraps. And keep it moist, consistently moist, but not sopping wet. And you should turn your compost pile every couple of weeks. And of course, this process takes time, generally about six months, but you can accelerate the process by adding a source of nitrogen either in the form of granular commercial fertilizer or manure or even grass clippings. Any time of year is a good time to compost, but the fall is particularly good because the leaves are everywhere. Did you know that you can build a compost bin in a single day? Everything you need should be available at your local building supply store. For my easy to follow building instructions, log on to my website. That's pallensmith.com.
Now that we've seen how to clean up the garden for fall, it's time to focus on all of the tools we use almost year round to get the job done. You see, they need a little TLC too. Gardening tools can be expensive, and if you're like me, you're so busy during the spring and summer, you really can't take care of them properly. And it's not until this time of year when things slow down that you can give them the attention they deserve. Recently, I discovered a way that makes taking care of them much easier. There's really nothing to it. It involves three basic ingredients, a bucket, some cooking oil, and sand. Tools like my pruners always seem to be pitted and covered in rust. It's because a lot of times I leave them lying out in the garden. By keeping them well oiled, I can keep them rust free and the mechanism in good working order. Let me show you how the idea works. Start by filling a bucket with dry sand and then pour about a half a gallon of vegetable oil evenly over the top. Let it sift through and then push your tools in. One of the great things about this idea is that the coarseness of the sand serves like sandpaper. It keeps debris off of the tools. And of course the oil keeps water from damaging the metal. Now, an easy way to take care of larger tools is to take vegetable oil in a can and just spray it on a tool like this. What I like about this is that it's become a permanent home for my hand tools. I always know where they are, as long as I put them back. And the other thing is by using vegetable oil, it's easy on the environment. Coming up on my favorite part of the show, planting. For me, it's like painting with plants. When we return, I'll show you how to get instant color and bloom in your fall garden. Plus, why you'll want to plant now for blooms this spring. So stay with us. a beautiful garden year-round, I find myself constantly planning ahead. In the fall, when the trees are full of beautiful colors, it's always a reminder to me that I have to start thinking about the springtime. You see, the fall is the time to plant many of those beautiful spring flowers, like daffodils and tulips. Now, if I want to have beautiful flowers in my fall garden, like asters or dahlias, or even all of those marvelous salvias, I typically plant those in the spring or summer. You see, I look at a garden like a work of art that's constantly progressing. And to keep that progress moving along, we well, have to have a plan. So let's start by looking at some perennials that I grow in my garden that you may want to try. Besides a traditional chrysanthemum, there are a lot of other flowering plants that are at their best this time of year. And that really shouldn't be any surprise to us if we take our cue from nature. In early fall, in many parts of the country, the roadsides are awash with color from native wildflowers that come back year after year. These include perennial sunflowers, the blue mist flower, or sometimes called perennial ageratum, as well as goldenrod. A lot of people believe that goldenrod causes hay fever. Well, it's simply not true. You see, it's a lot of the other things blooming at the same time that are the culprits, like ragweed. It's a shame that goldenrod has developed this reputation because it can make a fine garden plant. In fact, I grow one in my garden, which is a dwarf variety called golden fleece. There are many other fall blooming perennials that I can't imagine my garden without, like this sedum called Autumn Joy, and this Mexican sage just now beginning to come into flower. And for shade, a couple of my favorites are this tiny flowered toad lily and the Japanese anemone. Now that we've looked at some of the blooming flowers of autumn, let's move on to flowers we can plant this season to enjoy in the spring. Probably the most popular spring blooming flowers to plant in the fall are tulips and daffodils. But to have them blooming in your garden this spring, you need to plant them now. Let's start with planting a few tulip bulbs. I think tulips are the most dramatic when planted in drifts of all the same variety or in the same color family. And I generally plant mine in clumps of 15 to 20 bulbs. Some good companion plants for tulips are cool weather annuals like pansies and violas because they flower so close to the ground. Like most flowers, tulips show themselves off better when planted against a backdrop of other plants, like perennials or a low hedge. Now don't let the idea of planting a few tulip bulbs shake you up. There's really nothing to it. 
you see the flour is already packaged inside this little brown wrapper. All you have to do is coax it out by planting them properly. When I plant tulips in my garden, I dig out an area the size of the drift of blooms I want. A good rule of thumb for the depth is to cover them three times the width of the bulb. And I always work in good, rich compost and bone meal before placing the bulbs about six to eight inches apart, and then I cover them. Now don't let another fall go by without planting a few of these beauties in your garden. Next spring, you'll be glad you did. The techniques for planting daffodils are similar to tulips, and like tulips, there are a lot of varieties to choose from. One complaint gardeners have is that just when things start kicking in the garden, the weather changes. Well, when we come back, I'll show you how to extend your gardening season into the cold months. I'm always looking for ways to extend my gardening season. Every year I try to plant a fall vegetable garden to take advantage of those last few warm days. But even in the mildest climates, temperatures can drop suddenly and cause big problems in the garden. So I'm always looking for solutions. I came up with a simple design for a cold frame that sits right on top of the raised beds in my vegetable garden. If you don't have raised beds, I've found this concept helpful for bringing plants through the winter by setting it on top of bales of straw. The first step in putting this together is to build a two by four frame. And to save time, I had the boards pre-cut at the lumber yard. This concrete reinforcing wire is strong stuff. It's the key to the support. Now, it can be purchased in standardized rolls and then cut to fit your cold frame. Now, I always try to cut enough to create an arc that's at least 24 inches high at the highest point. This gives me plenty of room for ventilation and enough room to work. I attach the wire with large staples and then secure this four mil plastic sheeting with smaller staples and I use a nylon fabric strip to keep it from tearing. Ventilation is important and you can get this by leaving the ends open or cutting slits in the top. Cold frames are a great way to protect plants and extend the gardening season. I really enjoy container gardening, I guess because it's so inclusive. Anyone can do it and it doesn't take much space. I also like it because it's a great way to get a splash of fall color that'll last for a long time. I'm into using and reusing, so when I choose plants for a container, I always want them to have a life well beyond this container and this season. For example, this viburnum will be the anchor for this arrangement. I chose it for the beautiful range of autumn leaf color. After all, this is what fall is all about. Now later, I'll plant this in my garden you see, this is the old-fashioned snowball viburnum, and next spring it will cover itself in large white blossoms. I wanted this nice full shrub for visual weight in the container, but I could have chosen any number of things, like this beauty berry, which is loaded with lavender berries this time of year. With the shrub in place as a backdrop, now I'm ready to add some more conventional fall things, like this mum, some cabbage and kale, and flowering asters. The main thing I've learned about putting these containers together is to be generous with the number of plants. I really pack them in, and I like to use a variety of unusual textures like this kale. And even though the colors of these plants are diverse, they all seem to work together. As a finishing touch, I'm going to add this needlepoint ivy across the front to cascade. And just like the viburnum, it'll have another life beyond this container. I'll take it in and use it as a house plant this winter. A great companion to P. Allen Smith Gardens is our website, pallensmith.com. Log on to learn more about today's topic. You'll also get hands-on gardening tips, design ideas, lessons in garden history, delicious recipes, and crafts projects that will take you from season to season, all beautifully illustrated with thousands of colorful images that will inspire your creativity. Plus, don't miss Alan's free weekly newsletter delivered straight to your inbox, all just a mouse click away at pallensmith.com. To me, the simple beauty of a transforming leaf such as this is far more enchanting than anything we might create. Even though we can busy our schedules with lots of projects during the fall, I hope you'll take the time to just stop 
and enjoy the tranquility of a beautiful fall morning, or just marvel at the design of one of these leaves. From the garden, I'm Alan Smith. This garden I dream of a bed of flowers Bluebirds sing of the beauty all around us And every time the sun comes out I can't help but smile Oh No, I can't help but smile. 